Sky. My first guest today is a dynamic Iranian-American entrepreneur, an author, and a founder of four startups that emphasize social impact and ethical business practices, all while he is still in his early 20s. Milan Kordestani was born in Stanford, California, to Iranian parents. He obtained his degree in environmental science from Colorado College and has written on different topics for numerous online publications, including Rolling Stone, The Huffington Post, Entrepreneur, and Forbes, to name just a few. He is a popular voice in the digital space on everything from AI to entrepreneurism. And he's also recently published his first book, I'm Just Saying, A Guide to Maintaining Civil Discourse in an Increasingly Divided World. And right now, Milan Kordestani joins me from Los Angeles, California. Hello, sir. Hello, John. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to have you on on the on the program. Thank you for doing this. I've just finished your book, and because of that, and because of the the subject matter that is so germane to everything going on in the world today, I'm going to focus on the book. And I thank you for writing it. Thank you for taking the time to read it before getting on a podcast to speak about it. So I really appreciate it. It shocks me that anybody would interview you about your book without reading the book, but I, but I, I do know that's the case as someone who's written books before. You go on yeah. interviews and somebody reads the back cover and does the interview. Uh, let me ask you this first. I mean, your interest in searching for healthy communication and civil discourse, part of the uh, subtitle of the book. Uh, It's not just from a rising social media star and entrepreneur getting clicks standpoint. This is quite personal for you, as I understand it. You write this in the book. You're a a young guy, but you say your life was changed when you were nine and your parents divorced. Of course, divorce will affect any kid. But how did it inspire the kind of work and focus you have now? Sure. So I think a lot of the... A lot of the excitement for me when it came to civil discourse was from a writer myself and trying to find my own voice. And I talk about the personal aspects of my life. I talk about my parents' divorce. I talk about being really young and traveling to different parts of the U.S. that were more conservative in the South and um, how, you know, those experiences were actually surprising because I actually had really positive experiences and, and, you know, meeting people who were so much more polite than, say, like the West Coast of the U.S. Um, And so there was... There was a lot of these moments throughout my life that were really impactful where I kind of just picked up these lessons on how to be a more effective communicator. And one of the greatest lessons, I think, um, I was maybe 16, 17 years old that I learned is that just being nice to people is like the greatest way to advance your life, your career, your personality, like everything is better if you can find a way to be kind to people. And But to actually be genuine in that how you show up every day, it takes a lot of practice. It's an art. And so that's kind of how I came to um, fall in love with the being an effective communicator. And then, you know, it was through, through writing, really, I started writing when I was 16, 17 for publications about different interests, whether it was agriculture, later entrepreneurship and and music. But um, throughout that process as a writer, I realized that in the culture of cancel culture, where people are so afraid to then share an opinion anymore, whether it's online or even in their personal life, uh, we stop having really important conversations that we need to have as a, as a society to, you know, find common ground to be able to be progressive. So that was what this book was all about. The reason I, I wanted to start with the, 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 the divorce, which you just mentioned a, a couple of times in the book, yeah. is because it intersects with a couple of things that you talk about in the book. And I think you you learn it seems like you learn this lesson uh, one might say the hard way through a divorce but two of the things you talk about that came out of that uh trying to understand what was going on with your parents being hurt by it etc was yeah. communication and you later in the book talk about understanding and empathy um mm. tell, tell me about what in your internal family unit before we get into the big ideas that we're going to get into of the book what you learned about those two things sure So, and divorce, of course, is like very common now, especially in the United States. Um, So I, I think it's really, I share the stories in the book, because I wanted to people to be able to relate to that and to hear those stories and see how they can take those stories and say, look, I'm not going to use this to be 
depressed for a lifetime or use this as a traumatic experience that holds me back, but instead as something that teaches me lessons and value and and I can take that and make it a, um, a something of good um, or, you know, taking the, the sourest lemons of life and making the best lemonade you can um, to be a little cliche there. Uh, so specifically some of the lessons, like when I, my stepmother, I, I had a really interesting relationship with her, um, you know, like when, when my parents got divorced and I, you know, I had a new stepmother in my life, that relationship was really weird. And, you know, my mother was hurting. And so she would say different things to me and my sister about her. And so it would create this like really challenging dynamic for a nine-year-old to go between houses and have to kind of keep up appearances. And so there was a lesson even in that, which was like, how do you be diplomatic between these two adults as a, as a young person? And how do you kind of um, not get in trouble, not ruffle feathers and kind of just like do that? And, and so that's a communicative tactic in and of itself. Um, I think learning how to what to respond to, what not to respond to, when to formulate your own opinion around certain things versus just taking in other people's opinions, um, not needing to respond to things super quickly when you don't know what's going on. Because a lot of times when you're really young, you don't know what's going on. And things I'm sorry, are I, I, mean, I do know you're something of a prodigy, but were you actually <laughs> thinking in those terms at the age of nine? Or is this analysis you're doing retrospectively of how you learn to be diplomatic? Yeah, so I think it's it's retrospective for sure. I'm looking back and I'm able to see how some of those moments then translated to other moments in my life. Like I was, I just did a lot of things really young. In addition to going through that experience somewhat young um, or th through the formative years, like, you know, starting my first business and having to kind of like hide that from my parents because I wasn't supposed to be running a business while in school, you know? Um, and, and so like, I, I share those stories in the book as well, but just in general, like being a young person going through things that you don't understand, you end up having to become a lot more wise, I think, at a, at a younger age. And uh, I don't think that's unique to me, you know, or you or you don't is. and you succumb to it and and become a bitter, angry person, I suppose uh, you, you've chosen. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's why I write books or, <laughs> you know, that's why I write content to inspire people. You, you, to I mean, you, you don't just write books, story. but you don't just write books, but you're, you, you don't lack for ambition. The impetus for your book, it does seem quite grand. I mean, in the foreword to the book, Abbas Milani says, let me quote him. Milan has set himself the Herculean, but commendable task of saving and promoting the indispensable pillar of democracy. I mean, this, this is big yes. stuff. You're like Lincoln. Do you, do you, <laughs> according to Abbas Milani, do you see your mission that way? Um, so in Lincoln being very political, being a president, uh, I don't see it in that way. I see it more in a philosophical realm. Uh, well, a lot of what I like to think of myself as is an ability to connect people to a better version of themselves or show themselves a, a mirror to who they could be and I do that a lot by doing that to myself and putting that on camera and, you know, like um, just this mentality that we have to constantly adapt and be willing to change and it's going to be awkward and sometimes it's going to be weird and ugly and, and uncomfortable, but we have to push through that. And there's many people throughout time who talk about this, right? Like the stoic philosophers are ones and uh, are people who talk about this and, um, and so many others, but yeah, like when I think of, like, I'm someone who really strives for excellence. I grew up in the Silicon Valley where I saw a lot of incredible people change the world. And so from, and my parents as well. Um, so for me, there is this like constant curiosity about how do you practice excellence and what does excellence look like? And what does it look like in different industries? And as an individual in my work, and then also as an individual in my personal life, you know, and balancing those two things. So, so it's, it yeah. sounds like the answer is yes, that, that you do see your mission. I mean, you are, you are to save, well, like what would your <laughs> elevator pitch be? If I said, give me your, the mission of this book in one line, what would it be? The mission of this book is to inspire people to strive for common ground above all else in conversation. Beautiful. It's not to be right. It's not to, I mean, uh, to add on to my one sentence, it's like, it's not to be right or <laughs> wrong. We get one. The elevators, we reach the floor. We're, we're, we're leaving Sorry. the elevator. Yeah, I don't want to that was you. good. Uh, now, uh, let me ask this, and, and I don't ask it at all in a patronizing way. In fact, I ask it in a um, in an inspired, I'm, I'm inspired by you. You are 24. Yes. And you are, I mean, which is younger than 25. You're 24. 
you are doling out career advice ideas about how we should govern ourselves socially, even how entrepreneurs should stay positive in business. I mean, beyond the book, in terms of all the things that you put out there, you seem to have a captive audience. What yeah. has given you or what has what gave you the confidence to think people would listen to you? I think it's like a willingness to fail. Um, and just to like look stupid or be wrong. And it's, I follow all of the generic people who entrepreneurs tell you to follow from Gary V to Oprah Winfrey and so on. Like I, and shark tank, like all of these people throughout life, as you watch them and you see the pieces of advice they give out, they constantly share stories of when they failed. And it's really important to hear successful people talk about how, when they failed, because it shows you that you kind of, it's a, it's a rite of passage. You have to go through that. And so even in the social media era we live in now, um, you're right. Like for me to sit there and doll out advice to people as though I've, I've lived some of these stories for decades um, could seem really like contradictory or there, there's definitely a lot of imposter syndrome sometimes when I do that. But what I keep reminding myself of and what these people I follow that inspire me um, to remember is that it is the uniqueness of my perspective of being the young person of, of, yes. you know, getting my perspective as a young person and what inspired me that will allow that next young person or that person, my age to be motivated by what I'm saying. Um, whereas, you know, they might hear it from someone else and it doesn't, it doesn't hit the right way. So yeah, that's I, kind you're, of, you're, you're unquestionably, of you are unquestionably a valuable voice, I think, especially mm -hmm. because of, of your, you, you have a perspective that I don't have because I'm not in my twenties anymore. So you have that, you have that perspective. I'm just curious right. about you. Right. And I should say, yeah. let me put the asterisks on it that I don't, I don't at all get a sense of you. You're not cocky. It's not like we watch this and go, Jesus, this guy's so poor, you know, it, but yeah. there is a confidence there. And I, I'm watching you and I'm reading the book and I'm thinking, do you ever have, you, do you have those moments where you go, who, who the fuck am I to be telling all these people how to be entrepreneurs and how to, how to live their life and how to talk to each other. And I mean, you are not just speaking to 20 year olds, you're yeah. speaking to the world, right? All the time. I have it all the time. It's imposter syndrome and it gets worse every time I try something new and it's something new, more challenging. Uh, this coming Tuesday, I'm speaking to two congressmen and moderating a conversation between the two of them. I don't at all feel qualified to be doing that. Uh, but, you know, like little by little, you, you know, I, I, I didn't feel like I should have put out a book, but I wrote the book and then I had a publisher that wanted to put it out. And it was like, all right, let's put it out and see if people care. And then it turned out people cared and, and times got even more divisive and so on. And, and so, I mean, every single one of these moments I'm like, someone asked me the other day, do you still get, do you get nervous at all? Like, are you still nervous for some of the things? I get nervous all the time um, and, and quite often, but it's more so now, like, you know, I've taught myself to recognize the imposter syndrome as like the kind of protector in my mind and to like, see it, you know, like recognize it and just not let it be all consuming. And there's so many different practices in my life that I, I do to maintain the calm to be able to do that. Well, um, the fact that you persist is, is impressive and inspired and, and, uh, good for you. I'm, and I'm glad that you have some imposter syndrome that shows you're, you're human beneath the, uh, uh project prodigal, uh, uh, <laughs> robot that you seem to be putting out all this stuff. <laughs> um, so let me get to the book and, and, and also the broader sort of conversation that I, I, I mentioned that we've been. Uh, earlier in the show that the, the title of this program today is more polarized than, than ever. It's a question mark. It's a reference to how the world seems so divided. The subtitle of your book, I'm just saying, is Maintaining Civil Discourse in an Increasingly Divided World. It, it feels like that could not be more apt right now. Uh, the current and latest crisis in the Middle East, of course, the possibility of a new world war, seemingly particularly fueled by extreme rhetoric and division in social media. Do you believe we are all more divided than ever? I think that we are more divided than ever, but that we, well, I actually don't think it's more divided than ever. I think about a year or two ago, we were really at a peak and it's kind of this constant like peaks and valleys, but, uh, 
right now is a really is is a peak moment for sure. And what I think is starting to happen is people like me, whether it's putting out my content, putting out a book, um, and others are starting to recognize that it's really problematic. And that, you know, we don't have to all be on this media cycle constantly riding with every single world problem that happens and feeling like we have to have a response to it. Um, I have people send me, you know, text messages and group chats being like, who do we think caused this bombing? Or what do we think this, like, what do we think happened here? You know, and I respond being like, who are we to have the information for this? And even if we did, I don't, I don't know that we can do anything in this moment. Like, just be quiet and listen and see what the world is saying and just kind of like take it in. Don't have, You don't have to have an opinion on everything at, at every moment. And so I think, I think the conversation is changing and there's more focus on, you know, how dependent we are or how much time we spend on social media just consuming content. But I do think it's it's a quite a divided time right now, especially as we head into another U.S. election. I think it's only going to get worse. And it's not just the U.S. I mean, it's you see that kind of polarization everywhere in the world, in yes. uh, in Iran, here in Canada, even you know. Um, let, let me zoom out. I mean, I'm someone who the internet is undoubtedly um, uh, something that has done you know has has created magical wonders, uh, including. Yeah this this whole program I mean, what we do right now it's all digital it wouldn't exist 25 years ago 30 years ago um you and i talking on zoom and putting it out there and whatever uh that said i i i blame the internet i mean i i think that we are worse off in terms of the the dialogue in terms of the discourse uh today than we would have been 20 years ago there's so much anger and so much loneliness in the world today yeah. Do you think, what is the role of the internet and social media? Because, um, or let me put it this way, to ask you the question, do you think the internet, you know, it's a broad term, has helped or hurt civil discourse? Ooh, I thought you were going to say humanity, and I was like, oh, easy answer, net good. Um, but I think civil discourse in particular, I think it has hurt. Uh, and... The reason I say that is because while I think it's created more informed people, people don't know what to do with that information. They weren't taught what to do with that information. And so they regurgitate and reshare whatever they see online without fact checking, without ensuring accuracy, without forming a fully informed opinion, checking other sides of things. They, they, they you know, unintentionally go down into echo chambers where they're fed the same types of information, not knowing that on that same platform, there was a world of the entire opposite opinion that exists um, that you wouldn't be exposed to because they're trying to reinforce what you like and keep you on the platform. Uh, so, you know, I think for civil discourse, it's it's not it's not been good for humanity. When you say people are more informed, are 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 they are we? I mean, uh, uh, it feels like we're informed about a thin layer of a lot of things, but yeah. the reading books or going deep into issues is eroding and evaporating. I mean, it, it, it's uh, what good is it to to be informed if the information is coming from a headline that you read on X? I agree with you because that's another problem, right? Like people just read headlines and then they they all of a sudden feel like they're you know, uh, social justice warriors for a certain topic without knowing much about it at all. And then all of a sudden some, you know, like we can talk specifically like in this Palestine and in, in Israel conflict that's happening right now, like it's so easy for people to just say like, oh, like I, you know, I stand with Palestinians or I stand with Israelis and I stand with people dying. And it's so easy for someone else to come be like, well, you're sympathizing with terrorists or you're sympathizing with, with uh, you know, people who are causing genocide and so on. And it's just like this, it's really easy to have just like see someone as the other on social media, instead of seeing them as a person that might not have a fully inform yeah. informed opinion, who might be new to this topic, and is just trying to put out some support. And so, you know, intentions could be good at first, and then it just quickly, you know, swings the other way. And, and then it erodes further when you take relationships that have been built over years, and in moments on social media, you can hit unfollow. I don't want to see this content anymore. I don't like their opinion on this. And a relationship has just been 
really damaged. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think that's good for society. And yet, and yet you do believe that intention, uh, your intention, our intention, anyone's intention to try and right the ship or change things can be important, can be powerful, can be effective. You, you say, let me quote you, civil discourse is within reach. Those who promote the idea that it is impossible are creating a self-fulfilling pro prophecy, which reinforces negative discourse practices. Embrace the belief that it's not only possible, but essential for meaningful conversations. Do you really think we can somehow uh, manifest civil discourse by believing in it? Yes. So one of my favorite quotes is that democracy dies in darkness. When we don't actively believe in democracy and like fight for it, it does die. Um, and civil discourse, you know, like it, 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 a lot of it is entangled with the news and what is like the fourth estate, right? And so when I think of democracy, I think that freedom of speech is incredibly important. Um, so I do think that we can reach a point again when people actually prioritize civil discourse, because either we have to, um, you know, we have to come together at some point, or which, you know, unfortunately, usually happens around war wars. Um, but uh, I think that it's, it's a requirement, I think, to, to uphold civil discourse, because it's, it's, it upholds democracy. I hope you're right. Because even a moment ago when you were talking about how uh, you think this year things are, there's people like you, there's other people out there who are who are tr trying to call this out and, and look for more reflection and more civil discourse, et cetera. Uh, I, part of me was inside, of course, I would never do it uh, in front of you, but rolling my eyes going, well, I mean, really? Like, it just seems to be we're on yeah. a track that is getting worse and worse. And now with the propagation of, uh, of, let's call it fake news um, on all sides and being created by AI and bots. And, you know, no one knows was the hospital bombed. Wasn't it? Was it the parking lot? Who? Right. Did, I mean, all of that and no one's taking the time to wait and find out. And even if we do, what do we know? What's the truth? I mean, that's scary stuff that can feel pretty dyspo dystopian. And yet your, your hope or belief that we can change things is something I would like to believe in. I I think we have to. I mean, uh, another one of my favorite quotes is that we have to act as if it's possible to radically transform the world and we have to do it all the time. And that's the truth. I think especially like it, when I talk about me and my why my opinion is unique as a 24 year old, it's because it also comes with that mindset. I get the privilege of having a, a, a you know, imagining I'm going to have a long life and have all these different opportunities and doors to knock on to show up and try to change the world for the better. And if at this age, I don't believe that's possible, what reason do I have to wake up every morning and get out of bed, you know? So, so really it has to, that optimism has to exist. Um, that's, why the, that's why the Iranians love you. You see, <laughs> has to, you're giving us this hope and, and, and being proactive. Let, let me ask you about some of the basic rules you identify or suggest uh, about how we can achieve some kind of civil discourse and have a, a positive and productive discourse. Uh, one of them that I really like is you talk about self-reflection. Yes. How, how do you practice it? How do you practice it? Oh, so many ways. Um, I set a lot of time early in the morning when no one else is awake uh, for my own self-reflection. And specifically also there's meditation there's like you know there's there's like lots of different ways that i get in the right mindset and zone to be able to self reflect um some of the other ways are going to therapy and talking to a therapist i have a coach or that i a business coach that i work with to talk through things as well so all of those moments are really important like if whether it's in a work capacity why did this negotiation with someone that I'm working with go so poorly? How did it end up getting like tense and angry, you know, and and talking that through with another person out loud usually allows for your own self-reflection when you hear yourself kind of solve your own problems. Um, the same is true in therapy. Yeah. But yeah. But you had me at I when I f first wake up in the morning. So what, yes. what do you, I mean, is it meditation or what do you do? You wake up and you, uh, and you I write, you write, I write. What, so what, what do you write in the morning? Uh, 
so like 80% of what I write never sees the light of day. <laughs> um, because honestly, it's that it's that same mentality. It's the, uh, the imposter syndrome. I'm like, I don't need to have an opinion on this. No one needs to hear this. And sometimes it's true. It's not imposter syndrome. It's like, yeah, this is my opinion. I needed to write this to flesh it out and understand my own opinion and the nuances of it better. But it doesn't need to exist in the world permanently on the internet. Right. But if Shakespeare took that attitude, we'd never have the canon of impressive. And of course, there's that as well. So, you know, there's a balance there, but that's what I do. I, I unpack thoughts and sometimes they make it out and sometimes they don't. I just wrote this really interesting article that was kind of like, me playing around with the ideas of like what excellence looks like in the music in the music industry like what does greatness look like artists showing up on time and just ready to go promoting their own work you know not believing their own hype and like early morning and i did a whole like that doesn't sound, that's not self-reflection that's you're getting to work i mean that's but that's me thinking about my own excellence and thinking about like how i exhibit excellence in the world and how i show up to things and so you know that's that part of it is like, that's everything I write starts with selfishly. It starts with me and what I think is important to say and what I'm learning in my own life. Um, because that's the only way I can actually have validity when someone asks like, well, why did you need to have an opinion on this? It's like, well, because I, this is what saves me. This is what makes me, you know, survive or happy or so on. Just, just cause I was totally indulging my own curiosity, but do you, is this like pre 8 a.m.? uh, pre, yes. pre coffee breakfast, anything. I mean, what, how, how quickly do you go from getting out of the bed to, to writing? Um, I get out of the bed, I go to the bathroom, maybe I'll take some vitamins and then I will get back into bed and type. And I open my laptop from there and I keep all the blinds closed and I pretend it's darkness. The hour by this point is usually like 6am is when I'm doing this. Um, and on a good day, it's earlier, but I, the good days are only possible if you go to bed earlier. So if I could, you know, there's crazy nights I go to bed at 7.30 or 8.30 PM, just so I could wake up in that like weird groggy state at 5.30 AM to be able to like have this really like intimate writing session with myself to think through all my thoughts. You're one of those who believes in what's it called the circadian rhythm or whatever you should get up with the sun. You should be, uh, or you should get up earlier than the sun, I guess, in your case. I'm less religious than that. I'm one of those people that believes in like seven hours or plus of sleep a night and to do what it takes to make that happen. And so if you are going to bed late, you're probably going to have to wake up later. And I, I don't actually think that's good for you, but I mean, are you, earlier are you, I can get to bed, the better. Are you in a relationship? Right now, I'm not. But when I was, to be? so hard. <laughs> yes. No, I, I just I just was. And um, I, Hi, honey. I, uh, this is going to go really well. I'm going to go to bed at 7 p.m. each night as a 24-year-old. Don't have any aspirations of me taking you anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the person I was just dating was okay with it because she also was like, would work a lot and loved early mornings. So it's kind of finding people that have that same mentality about early mornings that that reinforces that habit. But I'm also really flexible. Like, I think it's important to be flexible about these types of things. And I can find that meditative time elsewhere. But at this point in my life, that's where I'm finding it. Another thing you talk about in the book in terms of the, the basic rules is tone. Uh, mm. How big a problem is tone? It seems to be uh, oh taking of tone when we're dealing in the digital space. And how how do we... How do you correct that? So I think it's first, since it's you and I speaking, like Iranian mothers are one of the most interesting examples of tone, the range of tone when it's like, and I don't know, maybe it's Iranian culture or whatever, but whether it's like when we speak to children and the high pitch that we get, and and then it's like the very quick, easy, like fieriness that we have and the like like, you know, a, a little bit of the anger in the tone, but it's more like passion rather than anger. So it's a very interesting culture, I think, to study tone from uh, as, as a young person, especially because I find that most Americans lack that same range. Um, and they're much more, I think, stoic. Um, and they they hide that that expression a lot more. So sorry, it just cut you off. It's not it's not always the the what is being said. It's the way it's being said. Yes. Like it's yes. like, a, you know, uh, it's either a simple question or do you want to go out with that person? Or, but, you know, the, it's always the, uh-huh, you know, it's the, it's the, and tone is, but 
of course, in the digital space, sometimes we're just reading words and no and, tone. There's no tone. It's no completely tone. gone. Right. And, and so that's one of the big nuances that's missing in digital communication that causes so many other problems, you know, like your tone could be inquisitive and curious and someone sees it as, you know, uh, satirical or like you're trying to make a joke and, and that makes all the difference in the world. So do you have a particular, I mean, what do you, do you use emojis or how, how do you modify tone to make sure that somebody doesn't take you the wrong way? I am very intentional about the conversations I have over text and what I don't ha allow over text. So when a conversation starts to go awry or it's like, it's very clear, it's getting heated or it's a topic that just is so nuanced that I don't want to type essays and I don't believe someone's going to read essays on the other side. then it's like, Hey, we should have this conversation on FaceTime. We should go get lunch. We should do whatever. And that's, that's the way that conversations used to happen. <laughs> and it inevitably allows for you to sit with someone and find common ground, um, whether it's on, even on FaceTime, you know, like it just, it goes so, it's so much better than over text. Um, let me ask you now about uh, that. That's, that's brilliant. I think that's actually, I really actually mean the word brilliant. That's a brilliant thing. What you just said in terms of taking the pause and going, let's meet and talk about this because we've all gone down the rabbit hole texting and, and, or whatever. And, and it starts to, you know, uh, like a, it's like a snowball after a while, if you're, because, and because the tone is, is even, even actually in that moment, sometimes I've looked back and gone in my moments of self reflection at 5am with my laptop, uh, on, on my, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't do that. I get up. <laughs> drink coffee and take my dog out and go work out unfortunately uh, although i do like writing in the morning I, i'm with you on that but maybe not at 5 a.m um but so often we don't pause and and think why don't i just pick up the phone and talk to this person or set up a meeting or something like that so that this doesn't right. amp up anymore i, I want to ask you about this is probably the most important part of it, as, as far as i can uh, as far as i'm concerned of what you talk about in the book and maybe the most difficult and you talk about bias mm. and how we can all be guilty of it as we know and uh Mila and I feel like we we live in a world right now where you can surround yourself I mean you spoke about it a moment a moment ago particularly digitally with yes. as much affirmation as possible like our platforms are created for affirmation, not information. We live in bubbles. And we see that right now with the, the Israel-Palestine Palestine debate, where, I mean, this week is, you know, if we if, if it wasn't, things weren't bad already, it's been a shit show of people coming at any information, objective information that might be out there, from their own perspective. So the same piece of information will be seen two different ways, depending on the bias. And then there's entire platforms. I mean, our primary communication sources that are designed to reinforce our biases. How do we possibly overcome that? You don't overcome the biases. You become better at recognizing them and knowing how to respond to people when they are acting on their biases. And then you as a person become better about choosing when you act on your biases. We're all biased at all points in time. Uh, and it, it's it's just we all have different lived experiences. And so to effectively communicate with someone who has a very different opinion than yourself, you're actually asking questions to try to understand their biases. How did they get to that bias? How did they get to that opinion? Um, what what happened in their life? Where did they go and visit? Who are the family members that are, you know, in their ear telling them stories or friends that are, um, you know, telling them stories that are making them empathetic towards a different opinion than the one that you have? And so that's really, I think, the only way to eliminate bias is not to eliminate it, but to be really good at recognizing it, calling it out, um, and having empathy for people's biases, because that's, that's I think, the biggest challenge of what I try to teach people in the book is like when you see it get uncivil, when you see someone have a different opinion, when you can, when you have that, when you get good enough, you have that split moment of decision-making of, am I going to respond to this or not to be able to inject empathy in that moment and be like, whatever I do, it's going to be with empathy. And that's how I'm going to act. 
And that is a really tough skill for people to actually believe. And so I said in my bio on Instagram, like I, I'm trying to make caring cool because that's the premise. You have to see this as the best way to live. You have to see this as like cool and it makes your life better. And, and that's hard. That is tough. I'm going to um, see this person who is uh, working for SEPA in Iran and supports this regime that's executing people and murdering people. I'm going to try and empathize with them and understand that well, <laughs> they grew up in that system. So that's why they're supporting it. Too bad people get executed. That's a tough one uh, to kind of accept, you know, and empathize. I understand what you're saying, but, uh, yeah. that's, that's tough. You have, so, okay. I'll give you the, the most generic version of it that I think as an entrepreneur that Gary V likes to teach, which is you're going to get hate for whatever you do. You're going to make a company. You're going to build a brand. You're going to put content out. Anything you do is going to generate some hate because it's people looking at you and you're exceeding like their, what they thought you would be, or, you know, the box they had put you in. And you make them uncomfortable. And so you have to, he teaches like, you have to have empathy for these people. Like how sad and miserable must you be in your own life that you're sitting there and you want to come and spew hate on me trying something new or me me trying to grow. And that's exactly what I think when I see these people in, in Iran who are oppressors or anywhere in the world that are oppressors is like, I, I have to think the only way to have empathy for some of these people is to think, you are so broken and so miserable in your own life that you want to bring other people down to that level. And all I believe that we can do is not try to meet that with violence and aggressiveness and hope that that's going to break through to people because it doesn't, in my opinion, like historically, I don't think it works, but instead to be like, Hey, there's a chance that you can still switch to the good side. And I can show you the light if you choose to, if you so choose. Um, now in Iran, I actually think it's when it comes to this regime, it's, it's regime, it's too far gone. Uh, I think it's, it's at a point of like, it's hard to know. both sides that one. Yeah. It's hard to both sides of that one. Yeah. It's, you know, but you know, when we talk about how the, again, the question of, are we more polarized than ever? Um, sometimes I, 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 you know, I think to a certain extent, we're going to need to go out of our way to hear other perspectives, right? Because it, part of the challenge of the civil discourse is going to be, we're going to hear somebody saying something and we see this all the time. I've seen it this week where somebody's shocked at somebody else's opinion, it's because they're not generally exposed to it. Because currently on my Instagram feed, I mean, you would know this stuff better than I, working in AI and technology and, and these platforms. But my Instagram feed has taught itself to feed me the things that, to, to affirm what I already like and believe in. So I'm less likely, this is not an objective platform, I'm less likely to see things that I disagree with, opinions, ideas, issues that I don't like and, and disagree with. So when I do see one, suddenly on the street, I go, where did these people come from? How is this, you know, and I'm, I'm shocked. Um, this is a... a this is based, this is a, this is in technology. This is in the, the, the platforms that we are using that, um, are dangerous or, or, I mean, how are we supposed to cope with that? We have to teach boundaries to people with these platforms and to teach them that this is, this is what's happening there because it's impossible to tell Meta or X or whoever to not do this. They're they're in the business of making money, right? And they know what works. And what works is to feed you more of what you like because you're going to stay on the platform and that's going to make them more money. So that is because that exists and you know, that's, that is capitalism and we subscribe to capitalism in this country. And you have to then meet it with the other side of it, which is you have to really teach people how to have a relationship with their technology and their lives and to know what to question and not just take at face value because it's only going to get worse. And so uh, I, the simplest way to say this is like technical literacy in schools. Like I do street interviews um, and I just talk to people on the street about like AI and what they're scared about. And half of them say, well, we're using AI on Snapchat. That's the only way I have, you know, I am using AI. This is young people, like 16, 17 year olds. And uh, and they say, but it's so creepy because it knows my location. And I say, well, but Snapchat always knew your location, didn't it? I'm like, I don't remember. I don't know. I don't think so. And I was like, I remember giving it the consent to your location. And they're like, no. And I was like, see, this is technical literacy that we're not teaching in school. And so 
if we're not teaching that, let alone are we, we're not teaching, hey, you can't, shouldn't be on social media all day long, every day. And when you're getting all of these news articles and there's some big crisis in the world, you need to step back, go look at other sources um, and explore. Because there's, in my work, I could name like five different platforms right now where you can go. It's a news site and it'll tell you, this is the topic at hand, Israel, Palestine bombing in the hospital. Here's three articles from conservative outlets, two from uh, liberal ones, one from an anarchist, one from a proclaimed communist publication. And here are like the highlights of each. Inform your opinion from across the spectrum. Um, I, should, I, should, I should say your your mastery or your your you know ideas when it comes to tech are not. Um, I mean, it's somewhat in the DNA, symbolically at least, because um, your dad, Omid Kordistani, is not, he's not just a prominent and successful Iranian, but very much so in the new tech and social media space, one of the founders, I mean, of Google, former chief executive at Twitter. What would you say, like, I'm so curious, the, the dinner conversations you've had now that you're in this space talking about this stuff, what, what would you say you have most learned from him about how we must navigate the digital world um what i've learned from him on navigating the digital world i think from him i've learned how the digital world is actually not the full reflection of reality because he doesn't live in the digital world constantly um you know like he's not on twitter posting constantly and he's not glued to his phone in that way and the people that he works with aren't either. They create this tech and they use it and they see value in it. Um, but they all have better relationships with it as the creators of this tech. And they know what to question and to say, all right, like I just Googled this information, but this is the internet, you know, like anyone could have put this. And so let me check other sources and and not have a public opinion. And so you see that even from like the founders of Google, Larry and Sergey. They're not on social media. They're not talking on every issue. They're not, you know, like um, influencers in the modern way. So and so many of the others aren't. And so as the creators of it, they have way better relationships to the tech than the consumers do. Is he, uh, you know, when you have the, these AI uh, founders, et cetera, who have, uh, I can't remember what it's called. They've, they've put out this new manifesto or something saying things are going too fast. Be careful. We're issuing a warning. Does your dad, is he, he, is he, does he sort of feel that way about social media that the things have accelerated to a point where it's, 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 it's going places where it was not intended. I don't have his opinion on that. Um, I think yeah, I don't know that I have his opinion on it moving too fast. All I can say is from me watching his usage of it, his relationship with it is very, uh, it's very much closer to like a boomer than it is to Gen Z or a millennial or Gen X or like, you know, he's very private on social media. And uh, I think, and even with, you know, my younger siblings, he posts even less content and wanting to ensure that they have their own choices that they can make and, and privacy choices. So I think watching his, his actions, uh, he's just much more intentional with it and kind of maybe understands that tech innovates very quickly and for consumers to catch up and for regulation to catch up and and all of the, the mental health issues that that causes in the transition is kind of just a, um, a byproduct of innovation. It's messy sometimes. What do your parents think of your book? What do they say? Oh, good question. There you go. You know. So my mom read the book and she loved it. My dad is not a big reader. I don't think he's read my book, uh, unfortunately. But you know, he he watches some of my content online, and uh, he's he's always just like very surprised. He's just like, wow, like I just one day you turned into Tony Robbins. It's crazy, and I, <laughs> you know, and he's he, he's he's proud and he he exudes that. But um, it's. Yeah, his. Did you not appeal to him to read the book? Uh, as... <laughs> I did, but I think uh, I don't know. You know, I think that for him, like he asks me a lot of questions. I talk about it a lot, um, and I don't know. There's there's some darkness to the book, you know, like for I think a parent to go and read through the, like the almost like the diary of your kid is a little bit intense. So there's a part of me that thinks that that that's his hesitance. 
you're most of your content, I think all of your content is in English, right? You don't do um, content in Persian necessarily. And yet you have a big Iranian following. Uh, you're yeah. an American kid. You're born in the Bay Area. Your parents are both Iranians and prominent ones, of course. How Iranian do you feel in terms of your self-identity? Very Iranian um, is the truth, because there are so many different moments. That, and I, I talk about a lot of them in the book, but like Farsi was my first language. I went to Mahdi Kudak in Iran for like three months out of the year, like multiple years of my, of my you know, um, adolescent life. And my community was always strongly Iranian. And my friends in school, even like, you know, I had a lot of, they were like me, first gen, you know, Iranian Americans, um, or, or Iranian immigrant parents, first gen born here. I had a lot of them in school and those were who I tended to be closer with and closer to my cousins. And it was basically through, I think, understanding that I was had a different, I had different circumstances. I had more family obligations than most. I had a closer relationship to my cousins than most. I, you know, we would disappear in the summers and go to Iran. Like that stuff all ended up making me much closer, I think, with my Iranian heritage than the relatability I had with like all Americans. Um, and, you know, down to the food I would bring to school as a kid, you know, and and having a unibrow and so on. Like it was just different upbringing and circumstances that made me really resonate with that. With and and do you feel a responsibility to Iranians? You you did an interview, well, you were the interviewer um, with Max Amini, and you asked if he feels a quote unquote moral obligation to representing Iranians as an Iranian American comedian. And let me put that question to you. Do you feel a moral obligation to the Iranian community as a rising Iranian American star and, and, tech expert and author so much um when when we see okay so like last night i went to this event code.org and code.org is uh founded by hadi partovi and his brother is ali partovi who founded neo both of them have sold companies to microsoft independently in their family they are related to dara khoshoshai who is like the ceo of uber and it's just like this star-studded family of like Hadi's been, Hadi's been on the show, actually. We, we did oh, it. Wow. Well, that's awesome. And like, but I look at them and I'm like, this is this is excellence. Like the story that they have of we came from Iran, we learned from a textbook how to code on a computer that had no software on it, and we found freedom through that and built a life and so on. And um, and and you know, my parents to an extent having a very similar story of that. And so I think, yes, like there is an obligation to pursue what I believe is like excellence, like, um, you know, being an inspiration for the next generation of Iranian Americans. And to an extent showing that we are great people in society that are doing amazing things. And so much of us are being held hostage in Iran by a government. Um, imagine what Iran could be, what the population of there could achieve, um, let alone just the few of, of us who are lucky to be you know, parents who got out of there or us to be raised here and, you know, and, and what we do. So, yeah, yeah, there's, there's some obligation. There's some moral obligation for sure. It's such a great pleasure to talk to you. I, I I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I know I can't keep you forever. Let me ask you a couple more questions before I let you go. Uh, one thing that you talk about a fair bit and you, you talk about it in the book, but you've, you've done some um, posts in your social media and your videos about it. Um, you, you talk about something we, you call the loneliness ep epidemic mm -hmm. that we have these days. Um, and I think people at this point have heard about how our obsession with our smartphones or the way the world is constructed these days has led to a great deal of anxiety, stress, depression in kids, loneliness. Um, are you ever lonely? Yes. Um, there's definitely moments where I feel lonely. Uh, especially, I think one of the easiest ones is like, when I travel for work, uh, it's like one of the more lonelier times, but I think, uh, and then after a relationship ends, you know, as a young person, like you end up when the pendulum swings back to like, oh, wow, now I'm alone in my room again. Um, it's, you know, I have those moments. And then also just the dependence on tech, uh, when you have all of the dopamine that comes from posting content and people engaging with it, you almost feel like the need to constantly be doing something in the scene, whatever. So that's a disparate way to say yes i have moments where i feel lonely and 
just like the biases or anything else, I've gotten really good at recognizing it and working on not feeling lonely when I'm alone. Um, because sometimes I really love it. Like that self-reflection period and what that's like, that's, you only get that when you're alone. And so you have to find the things that are really, you enjoy to do when you're alone to feel, I think a little, feel a little less alone, but yeah, the loneliness epidemic is going to increase. It was exacerbated by COVID, but technology plays a big part in it. Let me end off where we started and, um, talk about confidence and, and being able to forge for forward in a positive way as an entrepreneur, you talk about the liabilities of what you call the negative feedback loop. Mm. Um, that is you're, you're building something from scratch, but it can be attacked by those telling you it's a, the idea is bad or criticizing your business or launching personal attacks. We get that a lot. What, what is your prescription for overcoming the negative feedback loop? Um, you, you say we've got to learn how to stay positive. How do you do that? So this goes back to a little bit of like the stoic philosophy that I love and, and talk even about in the book. I really believe offense is something you choose to take. Uh, someone could say really hurtful, negative words to you, but they they really are words. And so it could be rooted in, and it always is, it's rooted in their biases. It's rooted in their lack of understanding, their lack of empathy, whatever it is. So when someone gives you either negative feedback and you start to feel angry or upset or whatever, it's re it's that moment I talk about where you need to like catch yourself and recognize why am I getting angry at this? Why am I getting upset? This person, maybe their tone is off. Maybe their whatever is off, but they just are trying, their intention is to give me feedback on this and I want to make something successful and I want people to buy into it. So I should want feedback and I should be able to take feedback. So what if that negative feedback is causes you to get canceled or that negative feedback causes uh, about your business means that a, uh, an investor is, is goes away or I mean, what, you, do, can you still be cool and calm and empathetic? So I think it's important to note that like the, you can't be perfect all the time. And and that's how I end the book, you know, is I talk about how even myself, I wrote a whole book on civil discourse. I'm not civil 100% of the time. You talk to my friends and they can tell you plenty of stories of me getting uncivil because someone said something hurtful to someone and I called them out or whatever it was. Um, you know, like you can't be perfect 100% of the time, but you should strive to be excellent as consistently as possible. Like in anything consistency is always going to serve you the best. And so consistently striving for, um, you know, taking feedback the right way when it's being given matters. And if you take someone's feedback and you don't like it, but you decide to act on it anyways, against your gut feeling and what everything else is telling you, you made a bad decision. You got to own that. You're running the business. But your ability to civilly take the feedback and then decide what to do with it later, that's everything. That's the preservation of relationships. I appreciate you, sir. Final question. I, uh, you're, you're 24, uh, a decade from now, you're going to be really old. You're going to be 34. Uh, <laughs> what, where does Milan Kordistani want to be in 10 years? Ooh, good question. Um, I'm really hopeful that in 10 years, so many of, uh, the old people in our government are gone and that I am hopefully able to help a lot of the young people who are in government. I don't particularly want to get into it myself in politics, but um, I really, I really enjoy the, the different ways I get to help people, um, whether it's helping them figure out how to express themselves better, writing speeches, creating a brand, um, becoming more effective communicators and so on. So that's one piece of what I hope happens. And then the other is my too work. Diplomatic, too diplomatic. You're already doing that. <laughs> well, I, I, I want, I know you're a guy at five in the morning with the laptop on your knees, uh, planning the future. Where, where do you want to be in 10 years? Be, be Rook. In 10 years, I'd love to be married. I'd love to have a kid. I would love to be doing a lot of the same things I'm doing now. And that's the truth. I I feel really fortunate to have like figured out kind of what I want to be doing and spending my life doing because it's so broad, you know, like <laughs> um, it, it, I get, I have my hand in so many different things. 
that truly consistency is the goal. So if in three or four years, I'm not posting content and you're kind of like, what happened to Milan? He kind of fell off. That's how you know I'm not where I want to be and, you know, on the track for 10 years. But if you are keep seeing my content, you're like, God, I'm so annoyed of this guy. He keeps putting out content about civil discourse, even five, six years from now. Um, you know, I hope to me, that's kind of success. It's like, I still believe I still have this mission and I'm carrying on with it consistently. And hopefully by then the audience is, is at least a fair bit bigger. I've hopefully convinced a few more people to believe in what I believe in. So yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> Great talking to you to be continued. I've really enjoyed this and I look forward to continue our, our, our conversation, uh, in, in other times. Thanks for doing this brother. Me too. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being so well-researched uh, for this conversation from the Maximini interview to the book. Well done. <laughs> thank you. I uh, hope to see you soon. Come up to Canada. Come, come, come visit Toronto when you get a chance. Okay. Sounds good. For the office. For the office.